is the 29th of January. Okay. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty. It was the videotape that gave Canadians a real-life glimpse into the police interrogation of a murder suspect. Unlike those often seen on TV, this one took hours. It was measured, calm, and seemed to go by the book. In fact, the interrogator was, in part, following a book, a rule book of sorts of a technique used by detectives across North America. And while it is clearly a successful technique, it is far from perfect. In fact, some Canadian police forces are now rejecting it. Joe Schlesinger tells us why in Truth, Lies, and Confessions. Millions of us watch appalled and yet glued to our screens as the tragedies unfolded in the macabre theater of the modern confessional, the police interrogation room. There was Terry Lane McClintock confessing to helping her boyfriend, Michael Rafferty, kidnap, rape, and murder eight-year-old Tori Stafford. Where did he get her with him? <laughs> before her, it was Russell Williams' turn. You ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? I have never been. Oh, no? Okay. When the Air Force colonel came in for questioning, he was confident, full of smiles and denials. Where is she? Hours later, he confessed. The successful interrogator in both these and other high-profile cases, Detective Staff Sergeant James Smith of the Ontario Provincial Police. One of the keys to his success, a book that most Canadian police forces go by. The book, The Essentials of the Re-Technique. It sets out the framework for interrogation. The technique was developed in the 50s by John Reed, a Chicago cop, who was also a lawyer. At the time, Reed's technique was revolutionary. Now though, voices are increasingly being heard that all we've done is to replace the arm twisting of the old third degree with mind twisting. That the Reed system is riddled with psychological trickery and should be scrapped. The Reed technique is guilt presumptive and it has a couple of highly questionable operating assumptions uh, which, taken together, uh, raise concerns about the reliability of the confessions that it gets. Timothy Moore is a York University psychology professor in Toronto who specializes in interrogations. He has watched hundreds of hours of interrogations, like the one of Russell Williams. You know there's only one option. What other option is there? What's the option? He has seen how the read technique can make a strong case against the suspect. Does it always work? Rarely work? Oh, it often works on the guilty, but the problem is it may also elicit uh, false confessions from the innocent. One such case arose in Guelph, Ontario in 2006 out of the death of a three-month-old boy named Jaden Lindemann. The hospital determined the cause of death, shaken baby, but could not pinpoint a time. In a household crowded with people who had access to baby Jaden, the police set their sights on the boyfriend of Jaden's mother, 21-year-old Corey Barbishaw. Nothing to say to you. I don't need this advice, I'm aware. Yeah. I'm not to say anything, so... Corey? I don't need you to say anything to me, okay? The interrogator, once again, is James Smith of the OPP. He makes it clear right off the bat, as the read instructions do, that he's not there to find out whether Amish shows guilty, but only why. That evidence is all there. All right? There's no issue about the fact that you're the one that caused these injuries to Jaden. Okay? The results of the Having started out by playing it tough, this read training video then suggests the interrogators soften the tone to gain the suspect's trust. Let's sit down and try to work this thing out. You work full time, you're trying to make an honest living, and what that tells me is you're not a bad person. This is how Smith put it. Or I don't think you're a bad person, but I, mean, I think you're a decent person. And I know this is hard to go through. We ask questions to develop investigative information. That show of kindness, though, as the training video points out, can quickly be turned into a double-edged sword. 
we present to the suspect two reasons for committing the crime, a good reason and a bad reason. Whichever one he chooses, he's admitting he did it. And this is the way Smith phrased it. Now, am I dealing with somebody who's a decent person or am I dealing with somebody who's a cold-hearted prick? What am I dealing with here, Corey? The clinch, you know, comes when Smith picked up a binder and skimmed through the pages as if they contained incriminating evidence. We know what happened. That's all been explained to us by the medical evidence and the experts and the, and the CSI people who do their job and they do it very well, okay? That rocked Army Shaw. I know. I have to do my dad no while I'm alive, so. Just knowing that I'd be kind of stupid for me to fight the church. After more than an hour of relentless interrogation, he confessed. I should take that realizing what I was doing. Please don't me for what I've done. As he confessed, he broke down. He was charged with second degree murder and jailed. All these years later, Corey Amishaw still feels the anguish. It feels like they basically pressured me into saying something that isn't true. Amishaw's lawyer, Craig Perry, maintains there was no evidence and the police knew it. There were numerous people in the house, so even assuming it was a homicide, they had no way of proving who did it or the identity of the perpetrator. So the confession was the only thing? The only thing. But that didn't matter. Lying to suspects is allowed, not just by Reed, by Canadian law too. Even today, Armishaw has a hard time believing it. I didn't think they would actually lie about all this having evidence, CSI, all the forensics, and, you know, it's either you're a nice guy that just snapped or you're a baby killer. Those are your options. That's it. To Craig Perry, this was a case of an interrogator taking unfair advantage of a suspect. This is someone who has no experience in being interrogated and who does not have the intellectual capacity to have a, a battle of wits against someone like this. It just, it's just not even close to a fair fight. At the trial, the judge agreed. He threw out the confession and acquitted Armishaw, saying he had been overcome by Smith's dubious tactics and superior intelligence. I'd have to say, after being pressured by Smith so much, I think maybe I did believe it. And up to a point, you know, because they're just drilling at you and drilling at you, and then eventually you're going to break. It is such a recipe for injustice, such a recipe for unreliable and false confessions. Uh, and it is clearly showing no interest in, in a truth-seeking function. This is not about seeking the truth. This is about seeking one goal, and that goal is a confession. Amishaw's mother, Sandy, remembers the moment the judge delivered his verdict. We hugged each other, and the tears wouldn't stop. And when I walked out of that courtroom, I said, the four-year nightmare is over. For his son, though, it's not over. The memories of what happened to him, his treatment by the police, the six months he spent in jail, and the more than three years under house arrest haunt him still. I could never do that to a child. Wouldn't even cross my mind. 